Okay, my name is Jeff Ginger. I am the director of the Champaign-Urbana Community Fab Lab, and today I'm going to show you one of the most fundamental programs we use at the Fab Lab to do prototyping and design work. It is called Inkscape, like a landscape of ink, and uh, it is an open source program that can be downloaded for free. So you can just go to Google and type in Inkscape and you will get this website, and you can go here to download, and you'll notice it's available for all platforms, for Windows, OS X, and even Linux. Uh, you will also need an additional program on OS X, the uh, window manager here, XQuartz, and it will prompt you to download that when you actually go download it. Once you have installed and downloaded Inkscape, uh, you can go ahead and launch it, and it should look something like this. Now, Inkscape is a vector design program. It is free and open source, which means there's all kinds of extensions the community has written, the code is open to everybody to modify, and it's a really great way to get into design. It competes with Adobe Illustrator and Corel Draw and some of those really big brand name products, uh, but it has this beautiful user base to it that really propels it forward. Now, when you default, open, by default, when you open the program, uh, you should get this canvas-like looking thing. And this is, uh, the default is the size of sheet of paper. So that's, that's your sort of work area. And if you draw things outside of that little sheet of paper, it actually won't be seen by any of the machines of the lab. Uh, that's, that's not considered to be part of the design space. So you really want to be working within that square. Uh, one of the things you're probably going to need to effectively use Inkscape is a mouse. Uh, this is because the scroll wheel is really helpful on the mouse. You can get away with zooming in and out on the trace pad. Uh, let's see if I can, oh, my Mac trace pad doesn't want to work for it, but it is possible to do. Uh, but it is easier to do just using a mouse. So now on both uh, Windows and Mac, you should be able to hold down the control key and scroll on your mouse and that will zoom you in and out. So you can see I'm sort of zooming in and out on the canvas there. And as you zoom in, one of the things you might want to do is move around. And so you can either hold down the space bar button. This is like the Adobe pan tool or hand tool. Uh, you can also press down that scroll wheel, like literally press the wheel into the mouse and that will also allow you to pan around. So you can zoom in and out, zoom in and sort of pan around and this will allow you to focus on the details of your design as you're working with it. Okay, uh, the other thing that might happen is you might like zoom in like this and oh my god, where did you go? You don't know what's going on. You can hit the five key on the keyboard and that will zoom you right back out just to the overall view that'll make it really easy to see what's going on. Uh, if you'd like to adjust your canvas size, you can go up here to File and Document Properties. And if, especially if you set this up at home, you're going to want to adjust this. By default, this is going to be in pixels. Now, pixels are fine if you're a graphic designer, but if you're working in the Fab Lab, you probably want to think in real units like millimeters or centimeters or inches because those are what we actually measure things with in the real life. So we don't say this ruler is 12 pixels long. That doesn't make any sense. Pixels are a relative unit. So uh, if we go to inches there and inches here, th that should convert it to something that I'll recognize. And you can see that's almost an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. If I wanna match the size of the epilogue uh, laser engraver, I can set this to 24 inches wide and 12 inches tall. And then I can just close, there's no okay button in this dialogue, you just close it. And now if I hit the five key, you've noticed it's, it's now filling up pretty much the whole screen. It's, it sort of matches the wide screen of my computer pretty well here. All right, so the first thing we're gonna to do to get started is learn how to draw shapes. And there are a bunch of different shape tools we can use, but uh, the easiest are the rectangular or square tool, the ellipse or circle tool, and the star or polygon tool. So we're gonna go ahead and start with that rectangle tool. And if you just select that on the left there, should be, I'm trying to move my mouse there where you can see it, it's all the way on the left, and I can start just drawing polygons, uh, or, or specifically squares or rectangles. Now, as I draw this, uh, it, will, it will have the dimensions sort of noted up in the top here. You can see like right underneath where it says file, edit, layer, all that stuff. It actually gives you numbers, and so you can be very specific. If you want to set this to exactly 4.5 inches, you can adjust that there, and there we go. We've set that number. Uh, we can also adjust the edges to be curved. See, I can click that, and it will incrementally make rounded edges to the rectangle, which might be really helpful if you're trying to create that kind of design. Uh, if you would like to use the visual handles and adjust it to a specific amount, you can actually grab these little guys here, these circles and the corners on it, and adjust it to whatever specific amount you'd like. Uh, if you've messed that up or if you just want to get rid of them, you can go ahead and just set these back to zero, and that will undo what we were just doing. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in in here so you can see what I'm doing a little better here. All right, now this works the, essentially the same way for all the different objects you can draw. So if we make a circle here, uh, again, we have the ability to adjust it as an ellipse, and we can grab this circle here and make sort of this Pac-Man thing if I go far enough. 
oh maybe I'm using the wrong thing so you can see up here that that's that's where it's actually going to cleave off part of it to make it like a, as if something had been sliced off but we can switch it to this to sort of make pac-man and pac-man can go oh there's oh it switched it back oh, I'm using the wrong tool but anyway you can adjust the where the ending is to have pac-man open his or her mouth uh, wider or, or less and that's that's one of the ways you can adjust the node if you wanted to make like a pie chart or something now, uh, I just did something that you're going to be doing all the time. So I drew a couple of objects, and now I want to move one or select one. Instead of trying to do that, like if I try to do that with the square tool, like if I draw my rectangle and then I like try to select my rectangle with it, I'm just going to dr continue drawing rectangles, and that will get really frustrating. So if you don't want to do that, you can hit Control z and just start undoing things. You can also go here to this arrow tool, the Select and Transform tool, which is also the F1 key, and that allows you to left-click on things to select them. So if you select them, you can then hit the delete key and that will get rid of them. You can drag a big old box around lots of things to select more and delete many things. You can also do control A to select all the things on your screen to delete them. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this off just so we can get to the other tool. So the uh, polygon tool here, uh, or the star tool, is really kind of neat. So by default, it draws this nice little yellow star, and we can adjust the prong length if we want to, and we can even kind of make our star dance. Here we go. Da -da -da -da. And you've got some other kind of neat functions up here. Of You can uh, make it rounded on the edges. We can add more corners, sort of get like a jellyfish thing going on. And here we go. If I hold down this button, I will become a professional modern artist. Ready, set, boom. Oh my god, I made crazy cool modern art. So that will randomize how the prongs and the star work. And you can kind of even make that random art dance by adjusting the corners. And that's that's kind of neat that you could algorithmize that. So if that gets all screwed up, you can just set everything back to zero uh, for a rounded. Uh, your spoke ratio, if you set that to zero, that'll cause problems. Uh, it's better just to adjust it to something in between. So those are the basic shape tools. Oh, sorry, I missed. Uh, there's also this one. So you can adjust it to... Uh, be a polygon so you can say I want a triangle da, 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 only three corners and you can do many more if you want a hexagon or whatever other kind of cool shape you like and you can also randomize these and round them just like you might do other things so those three tools are how you draw a lot of basic shapes uh, you can also go over here and there's a pencil tool if I want to like write my name here we go it's gonna look like a drunk guy wrote it but if I crank up my smoothing a little bit here to like 35 or something I can still look like a drunk guy while I'm writing it, but oh my god, look at that. It's smoothed it out. looks a lot better. And this actually works best if you're doing a graphic drawing tablet, uh, but that's that's a more advanced tool that we probably won't be using. It, it is nice to do. There is also this uh, cursive tool here, or this uh, calligraphy tool that also by default looks pretty good. And you can also draw lines with this Bezier Curves tool. Now this is probably the hardest tool to draw with. You click on it once, that's gonna anchor your start point. And you can see this red line I'm dragging across, and if I left click and I hold it, I'm holding down my left mouse button, I can start to curve it. And then I'm gonna do, here we go, something like a, that. There's my curve. Now if I right click at any point, that will finish my curve. So there we go, I've driven, dri driven, I've drawn my curve line here. Now if I wanna make a heart out of this, I can go and click on the bottom node, so I'm connecting it to that square. If I didn't click it on that square, it would not connect it. I'm going to click on this top square, and I'm going to do the same thing, where I kind of curve it and hold down with my mouse, and I have now drawn a really crappy heart. So now you could go back and adjust that later, uh, do multiple things. There are other ways to do hearts as well, but that kind of gives you the, the idea of the Bezier Curve tool. Now one of the things you might do if you want to make more complicated shapes, I'm going to go ahead and clear my screen here by selecting everything and hitting delete, is you can select uh, like a shape tool. So I could do, if I want to do a heart, let's go ahead and set our Pac-Man back. We got a 360 degree ending. Uh, we can draw one circle and two circle. And then let's go ahead and do a triangle. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, and something like that. And I'm going to go use my transform tool here and drag it on, on sort of on top. And I might want to like adjust this. And actually, this is a great example of how we might adjust things. So if I wanted to make this triangle wider, when I click on it with the free transform tool and the movement tool, I can one, drag it around and move it. But I can also do things like grab this arrow right here and make it wider. So that kind of matches. And you guys can probably already see what I'm getting at here. So you can also drag the bottom. And if you wanted to adjust it proportionally, you can grab one of these corners and hold down the control key. That will resize it by aspect ratio or keep the ratio the same. And you can see it just sort of widens nicely like that. And that's really, really important with text. Otherwise, text will look really stupid. Like here, let's let's type my name. 
and you know like if i then try to make this wider like look at how dumb that looks it might be done for effect but and then when you're trying to like size it with this see how everything kind of gets screwed up it is just way better to just like like hold down control so here we go jeff ginger and i'm going to resize it proportionally bam there we go so that looks keeps all my kerning everything looks decent Anyway, back to our heart example here. So I've got three different shapes, and if I wanted to merge these into one thing to make a heart, I can drag a big old box around all of them and go up here to path, and I can do a combine, or I'm sorry, a union. Combine might also work, but union will definitely work. So there, I have a less crappy heart. Still wanna, might wanna modify that a little bit. Uh, there are a variety of other tools over here uh, I will be showing you in a few minutes. Generally, you don't wanna use this big 3D box tool and the uh, the spray can is not so helpful. Neither one of those are helpful for the kinds of prototyping we typically do at the Fab Lab. If you don't like doing this control and scroll wheel thing, you do have a zoom tool over here. It's a pain in the butt to go back and forth on that though. It's probably way easier just to learn the uh, hotkeys to, and, or, and or use the mouse to do that. Now, if I wanted to adjust my heart, I can double click on it. And what happens is I get all these little square diamond things that are going on here. And these are what we call nodes. If I grab the middle one, look at what happens. I can start adjusting the edges of the shape. And when one of these things is modified, so you can see, like if I click on this, we actually have this node and it's got these these hanging, these like lines hanging off of it. These are handles. So this is a corner handle. And I know that because when I adjust this one side of the handle, it doesn't adjust this one. Sometimes they might be uh, well, these are all corner handles. That's all right. We will turn this into something else. So if I select this, I can go over here and change it to a smooth handle. Let's see if that worked like I wanted it to. There we go. That adjusts both at the same time. So this is just a way you can modify the curves and edges of a shape once you've drawn it. Uh, you'll also notice that my heart here has an outline with a that black outline. And maybe I want to just change its color. Well, down here, as you probably can guess, I can just click on things and that will change the color of the heart. And if I want to get rid of that border, what I can do is go up here to uh, object and go to fill in stroke up at the top. And that should, there we go, that opens up the bar on the right there and we have our fill in stroke options. Now if I, th this is all the fill color right here, I could get rid of the fill, I could you know make it a solid black, I could do some red, I could do gradients. Gradients are maybe not a great idea, just because the laser will have potentially have trouble with them, and they may, they may not look like you want them to. I know you might use this with more tools than just the laser, just warning you that there are better programs for that kind of graphics modification, like Photoshop or GIMP. Another thing to watch out for is there's this opacity meter here. Uh, if you have an opacity that is not at 100%, that may cause problems with the laser when you're trying to do vector cuts, which means when you're trying to literally cut something out. So when you're drawing stuff, try to make sure your opacity is 100%. If I want to get rid of my outside line, I can go to stroke paint here and I can just click on this X and bam, we got no more outside line. Likewise, I could also adjust my outside line if I wanted to change its color. There's a very ugly looking green there. We could do a blue maybe, uh, you know. <laughs> you can adjust it to be something like that. And you could adjust the width of that as well by going to stroke style and you could crank it up to be very high or very low. Now, if you'd like to cut out this heart using the epilogue laser, this is important. If you want to cut out a shape with the epilogue laser, you need to have your width set to 0 0.001. And it almost looks like there's no line there, no outside line. So I'm gonna go back to my fill and actually say no fill. Because if we sent this file as it was to the laser, it would cut out the outside line, but it would also do what we call an engraving or a rastering across the entire object. So it would actually scratch in all the, this red based on a grayscale color. So if you just wanted to cut out a heart and not have it, the surface of it blasted at all, you would just say no fill and have a stroke style, of, I'm sorry, a stroke paint that is solid and a stroke style of 0 0.001 inches. Now, if you wanted to actually use the universal laser, which is a little different, uh, you can have a larger width potentially. It's more based on color. And uh, what you would do is go to your stroke paint here and you would make sure that your color of that outside line is a bright honking red. How do we... How do we get to that? Uh, there we go, that's what I wanna do. 255 for the red code, web safe color. Very bright honking red. And that's because what's gonna happen is we're gonna tell the universal to cut certain colors and to scratch in or raster other colors. So that's the basic of that. Now, some other things you might do with Inkscape. If you wanted to make a cool name tag, uh, you might power open some sort of web browser here. Where's my Chrome? There's my Chrome. Okay, let's go ahead and launch that. And oh, whoops. 
losing track of my boxes here. Okay, so we're going to go to Google, and uh, today I'm going to look for a turtle. Okay, so I've typed, typed in turtle silhouette, and this is because it's going to give me much better images that will work better for lasers and stickers. If you have an image that has, say, millions of colors in it, which is most photographs now, it, you actually won't be able to have, like, your, your vinyl colors on the sticker cutter will only be limited by the number of colors you have. So, you know, maybe we have a dozen colors of vinyl. And the laser engraver, you're actually only going to have one material that's going to go in the laser, like wood or acrylic or something else. Okay, resume. So what we'd like to do is a silhouette because that will make a simple image return. So I've searched for turtle silhouettes here. I can go to images. And these will all turn into vector images really well. And I'll show you what I mean in a moment here. So I'm going to go ahead and pick my turtle. Now, I know all of you that are Mac fans, you're like, I want to just drag it into the program because that's how Macs work. Sometimes, but Inkscape is kind of cranky. So some images it will like and let you do that. Other images, it'll just crash Inkscape and you'll be crying because you didn't save your work. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to right click on our image. We're going to save our image as. We're going to use our wicked sick computer navigation skills to go to our desktop. And we are going to save that as turtle because we put our name on our files. So we'll say Jeff's turtle. Jeff's turtle here and save that on the desktop. We're gonna show you how to save in the network at the lab so that way that you have files that uh, don't get deleted accidentally. But in the meantime, I put this turtle on my desktop and I can go ahead and open up the turtle in Inkscape. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete my heart, zoom out by hitting five, and we go here to file, import, and hopefully, my de there's my desktop. All right, we're gonna go bring in Jeff's turtle. And it will ask you if you want to embed or link it. Embedding is a way better idea. That means that the graphic is going to become part of your Inkscape file. The file will be a little bit bigger, but it means you never have to keep track of that graphic ever again because it will be just part of your file. So I pull in my turtle, and if I zoom in, look at the edges of my turtle. Still pretty slick looking, but there's kind of this, this blurriness, this graininess. And this is because this is a JPEG file. This is an optimized graphic. It's made for the web. It's made to be very small. So rather, if you think about a, a graphic full of pixels as being like a sheet of graph paper, and each square is a certain color, well, you could memorize the color of each or have keep track of the data for each square. And that's a very large file, like a BMP. Or you can do a JPEG where you use an algorithm to determine what color should it be which means sometimes it's guessing what color it should be depending on proximity to other colors and it might get it wrong uh, or or be blurry and that's actually okay that muxing effect is not noticeable at large distances but machines in the lab don't really know how to work that so we need to give it a coordinate system because that's how most machines in the fab lab work is they cut or laser or stitch or whatever the heck it is uh, poop out 3d pl printer plastic whatever that is it goes from point to point to point to point so we want to turn this into a file that you can go from point to point to point to point. So if I zoom out, uh, I can see my turtle again here. And I can go up here to object, I'm sorry, path, and go to trace bitmap. And that's going to bring up this new little prompt here. And I can go ahead and just, the brightness cutoff means it's going to determine is it really bright or is it really uh, like you know light color or dark color. And it's going to use that cutoff to decide what should be traced or not. So if I hit OK, it looks like nothing happened. Inkscape is not always that great at you know usability and letting you know what's going on. But we have a hint. So I'm gonna do Control Z and undo what I did. And I'm gonna select my turtle again. And down here, you'll notice, see that in the where my mouse is? How do I like I can try to make this big if I go back and forth? There we go. See how my mouse got big? Down by there, it says image. So we have an image. That means it's a raster file. If I trace this and we go down here, whoops, did I not? Let's try and hit OK button. Again. There we go. Sorry, I didn't click on it. Um, now we've traced it, and now it says path. So it actually has changed. If I move, I click on it and move it apart, there we go. Look at this. Now, they kind of look identical, but if I zoom in, you'll see it's not the case. Here's our blurry raster graphic, and right next to it here is our crisp and clean vector image. And so we can delete our raster graphic and just keep around our vector. And if I double-click on them, look what we get. With little kids, I call this connect the dots. It's a path. It is lines between nodes or between those little gray squares there. And that makes up the actual structure of the path uh, or, or the vector image. And you can adjust these. We can have a narwhal turtle. Ba -ba! And now he's a very dangerous, awesome narwhal turtle. And maybe I can try to give him some ears. Uh, we can adjust all these different things in here. Much like I was talking about with the heart, uh, we could adjust the angles on our nodes. I can even turn this to a corner node. And maybe, like, you know, we could have a concave head. Oh, now he's going to eat something. This is kind of exciting, isn't it? Uh, and we can do some cool stuff. 
And likewise, just before, like I did before with the heart, I can merge things. Well, if we want to give them a, an eye here, I can draw an eye. And it looks like I've got to do some stuff. I'm going to get rid of my outside stroke up here in the upper right. And I'm going to go to fill, and I'm going to give that eye a solid fill. And he's got a kind of scary eye, but I want to merge that eye with the rest of the turtle. And this is one of the benefits of having a vector file. I can draw a box around the two. We go up here to path. And I can do difference and BAM I just cut the eye out of there we know the eye is a hole because look if I move it toward the edge of the canvas see so you can see the edge of the canvas through his eye so that is now a hole and if I double click you can see it's added those gray node boxes there for our upside down narwhal turtle who is about to eat something here we can give him a star to eat that or triangle there we go that's what turtles eat is triangles Okay, so uh, we have our, our, our image that we've traced here. Now this is great if you're just trying to make a, a sort of cool mythical animal. We're gonna do something kind of like that for the stickers exercise, but your first activity is to make a cool looking name tag. And so we wanna make something a little more professional looking. Turtle's great, but we can do better. So we can use the same principle to actually go get some ideas for how our name tag might look. Now, when you learn to play piano, uh, nobody starts out just improving. Everybody has to learn by copying, and that is something we're okay with at the Fab Lab. We want to make sure you give attribution, uh, and then we want you to eventually remix and change things to make them your own, but you can start out by mimicking you something you think is cool. So I'm going to go back to our trusty Chrome browser here, and instead of Turtle Silhouette, uh, we are going to search for Business Card. Let's see if that works. And you get lots of different kind of cool-looking business cards. And let's see if I can scroll through here. Okay, I found a couple of business cards that I think make good examples. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear my canvas here. And I'm gonna do that by hitting Control A, which selects all the objects, and I hit Delete. And now I'm gonna go up to File, Import. I downloaded these just like I downloaded the turtle. And we're gonna start with this business card. Now, this is actually hard to mimic directly. So what we can do is sort of put that over there in our canvas, and we can actually just kind of use that as inspiration. So if I think about, okay, here's my business card background. Let's go ahead and set the fill color to uh, like a white. Whoops, go there, yeah, 255, 255, 255. There we go, that's white. And we'll do a stroke outline. Of, there we go. So we've now got our frame for it. And maybe I wanna draw like the, some of the colors in there. So I can actually draw another box here, a rectangle. And uh, I'm gonna get rid of the stroke pan on that one, do a fill, and I'm gonna use my eyedropper tool here on the left, on the very bottom, Let's see if I can shake my mouse enough, there we go, so over there, and I can say, okay, I want it to be that orange. Okay, now we've got a piece that is that orange. I use the eyedropper tool just to steal the color from them. I copy and paste it, and I'm gonna line those two up, and now I'm gonna use my eyedropper tool again, and I use the blue. And you can see, so I'm actually kind of mimicking the design that they've got here, but not directly, because I can't like really directly trace it. I'm just kind of getting an idea. And I don't want you guys to directly steal something like this. What I'd like you to do is be like, okay, I like their color palette, or I sort of like the idea of maybe the, the squares at the bottom or the rectangles at the bottom, so I'm gonna steal that element of it. But you know what, instead of putting it only at the bottom, I'm also gonna put it at the top, or maybe I'm gonna put it at the top instead of the bottom, and you can kind of start messing around with it. Um, you'll notice that I just copied two of the squares there while I was talking, and you know I can just kind of go through and start sniping colors here with my eyedropper tool, and I'm starting to get something that looks a little bit like their card. So that's that's a way that you can sort of mimic something, and then just start playing with those design elements. You know, maybe later I decide, okay, this is a pretty cool like thing. I like these four colors here, like this. So I'm gonna do Control G to group it or you can right click and go to group. And now I can move this whole group around and I can kind of see, does it look good here in the middle? Is it good up over here? One thing you're likely to do is you may want to align things. So, you know, maybe I want to put like this here and I'm going to put my name on top of it, right? So I'm going to go over here with my text tool and say, Jeff, Ginger, blah, blah, blah. All right, there we go. So, and with my text here, by the way, I can double click on that and adjust all kinds of things about my text. I can go up here and say, uh, instead of sans serif, let's pick like a know, Helvetica as a famous graphic designer font. We can adjust my sizes on that. I can, you know, do the kerning, everything else. And uh, I can stick that up here and maybe make that a little bit bigger. And if I want to, say, align it, let's say this thing was floating out here and I want this thing to be aligned, my name to be aligned with this grouping of color, colored rectangles. I can select both of those things and go over here and there's this align and distribute tool. I click on that. And I can choose over here, I can say, okay, I want everything aligned along the left edge. Oops, is that, that's not the right one. I'm sorry, this one is the left edge. There we go, that popped my name over to be started in the same place and the same edge of this. 
Likewise, if I wanted to center the two things, I can go here. Now this is based on the uh, relative to the selection area, but I could also say largest object, smallest object, the page, all kinds of different ways of centering this depending on what your relative choice of uh, perspective is. <coughs> so you can see there, I have centered it uh, so that we can then put it in the, the middle with my name. And I can actually then select those two objects, select this outer uh, square, and then I should be able to do this. There we go, same thing. I just centered it within the whole business card. So that's kind of a helpful thing. So the two things going on there is that I'm using the align tool to center stuff. And then I'm also kind of like looking at ideas that they've made. Uh, another good example in here is you can see there's that creative thing. And this is kind of like a bad shape. So let's say I wanted to make that bad shape up at the top. Well, I would start out by drawing a rectangle. And there are a few ways I could do this. So one, I could just draw a rectangle like that, go back to my polygon tool, draw a triangle, and we gotta go back to our free transform. Maybe I gotta rotate that a little bit just to get it a little bit more, e oh, it's gonna be angry, there we go. Okay, and then I can widen that a ton and shrink it this way. And now I'm kinda getting close to that shape. See, I can overlap those guys there. And I know I'm going really fast. And you can you know, mess around and practice with this to start getting as fast as I might be. And you wanna have those overlapping. And this is just like the heart combination thing we did earlier. I can select those two guys and actually get, could even line them up there. I go up here to uh, path and we can do union and bam, I got my bad shape. So that's, that's one way to do it. I also think you can adjust it if I wanna do a rectangle and let's see if I can. So I wanna get into the nodes and the rectangle. Now by default, if you double click on a rectangle, you won't get the nodes. That's because it's a smart object. So I gotta go to this thing and uh, let's see here. We want, oh, actually I can't right click on it. We gotta go up to path and we do object to path. So that should, there we go, that just gave me the nodes. So you can see now I can start messing around with this thing. It doesn't just look like a standard square. I lost my ability to do the rounded edges and all the cool stuff the smart object does. I'm gonna just undo the two things I did, but I can do things like select these two nodes here and hopefully if I do plus a node, bam, right there. You see this, I hit this in the upper left. I'm going kind of quick here. Uh, upper left there, I just added an additional node and now I can just kind of let that node poke out. So rather than making a shape by combining shapes, I can also just adjust the number of nodes on it to make it into something new. So that might be a useful thing. So I would really encourage you to get ideas for layouts and colors and shapes and all those different things just by looking at other, other people's stuff. And you know, you might start with something like this, but you know, I can flip this upside down. What if this goes here? You know, maybe I don't want, I don't, maybe could this go on the side? Like I just play around by messing around with stuff. I'm already kind of getting this feeling of like, you know, it's an envelope or something that's, that's, you know, we're directing all the attention with these arrows right to the middle. Bam, this is all about uh, the me, the Jeff Ginger, or whoever it's gonna be about, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so you can see a lot of this kind of emerges as you go around just moving objects around the canvas and playing with them. So that's one way to get started. Another thing that's a little bit more direct with this reverse engineering bit, I can just clear my canvas, is I can go ahead and go import, and I'm gonna import this card. Now this one's gonna work because it's a straight on view. This is a raster graphic, so I can zoom in on that. And you can see it's nice and blurry uh, as we get it but I can make this a little bigger. And I still have my trace bitmap uh, dialog open here. If I use that, I can go to colors. And how many colors do I think in here are in here? There's the gray, there's like, you know, three or four shades of yellow, three or four shades of red. Okay, so let's, let's guess that there's like 12 colors at least. So I go down here and I set this to be colors. Let's move my mouse, so you can see where that is, colors. And then uh, scans is gonna, uh, the number of colors, pa or color, uh, runs it's gonna do, the number of times it's gonna go over it and make for different layers of colors. And if I hit okay, okay, we didn't get quite what I wanted, but it did make a vector file based on the triangle piece. And that's actually pretty darn close. Now this is not perfect. If I wanted to use elements of my trace here, excuse me, to make a name tag, what I'm gonna have to do is right click on this and ungroup it. And now we've got all these different layers and I can sort of move these apart. There's the gray, I don't really need that one. This gray, eh, we can probably get rid of that too. All I really think I'd want out of this is probably those triangles. And on any given layer, I can double click on it again and we get all those nodes and I can just delete them. I can uh, move my mouse over them as a big box and, and select them and delete them. And sometimes you get these hanging off handles. I can sort of just pull those back to their origin. There we go and it's looking not so bad. Do the same thing with yellow. So once again, I left click, I double clicked on the yellow or I clicked on the yellow with our node selection tool. 
and I highlight all these nodes and I can hit delete and drag that all back in. You notice I'm creating a fairly concise graphic here. So, and you, I, you also notice I have to do this a lot of times. I'm clicking on stuff, I'm deleting multiple parts and multiple layers. And that's kind of one of the things that happens with design is you're doing the same task over and over, you're messing with it, you're fiddling with this part and then that part, this other part. And you just kind of have to get used to that is that it's not like a test where you just memorize all the answers, take the test and you're done. No, this is like you mess with the thing a lot. Oops. So once you've got this piece, I might want to use this in my name tag, for instance. So I can shift or uh, select all this whole thing. You notice when I select it, there's these big sort of beefy dotted lines, which means there's lots of things selected. And I can right click on this and group it. And now I have a single discrete object that I might use as part of a name tag. So maybe I want to, I can go up here to object and I can flip vertical. Bam, that flips it upside down. And so now I've kind of got the bottom of my name tag. And maybe I can go up here and we'll do, let's do a rounded rectangle on top of it. That is a clashing green. That is pretty bad. So, but I can grab these nodes here, or I'm sorry, these edges here, sort of adjust. I don't know if it's perfect, but whatever. So, you know, I've kind of got this, this rectangle. If I know right now, this one's underneath the other one. So I can go up here to object, or is it? Yeah, it's a range. Here we go. Object and a range down at the bottom there and I can uh, adjust what level this is. So I think, can I just right click and bring it to front? All right, well, all right, the shortcut, there's it's over in here, but uh, the thing I like to do, if you can see where I wiggle my mouse up here, you can just say, all right, I want this on the top. There we go. So that layer is gonna go all the way up on the top. And uh, so we can kind of get that there and I can, let's get this this green looking better. So we can say, make this white and stroke paint, let's give it an outline. And you know, it doesn't really matter at this point, but there we go. So I've got kind of a, a name tag that's that's not perfect here, but this is based a lot on the one that you just saw me pull in. And you can kind of fill this out and start customizing it. And I would encourage you to play with typography. So, you know, the boldness of fonts and the sizes of fonts will indicate importance with them and look nicer. So I can bold that guy. Let's try and crank that up to like 48. There we go. See, that's already kind of looking like something. So here, just kind of by pillaging other people's stuff, I've already made sort of a name tag. Not really done. And a reminder that when you raster this out or cut this out on the laser, it's only going to be the color of the material you give it. So, you know, like wood or some acrylic or something. But uh, you could potentially use this as, you know, if you printed this out as business cards or if you had a printer, you could put that this on something. So the, the colors are not bad. The gradients will still show up. Like the lighter yellow will be scratched in less than this darker red. So it could still look good. It's just monochrome. And if you want to get a preview of that, you could just set it to be a monochrome color. Okay, so I think that's more or less the intro for the name tag. Uh, so you, you're going to need to f become familiar with all the different components in Inkscape. Obviously, there's lots of tools over here. I would like to really encourage you to do something that looks a little bit more professional. You can start playing around just like I was a few minutes ago with all the different shapes and structures. And maybe come up with multiple designs. That's fine. Uh, you're going to end up cutting one out at the lab. There'll be lots of people to help you. The first time you run through with a laser, make sure that there's somebody helping you. They're not easy to use and they're fairly expensive tools. And uh, this program, Inkscape, can be used for designing stickers and other things. I'm going to show a different method with Silhouette, uh, the Silhouette Studio. However, this you know the, you can basically make the same file in this and then import it into Silhouette if you would like to. That's that's a fine method for doing this. Uh, as usual, if you've got questions about this, do ask us. And we have a paper tutorial that is very exhaustive, talking about all the options and things you can do. That is a complimentary piece for my video. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in class.